thanks, Hugo, and thanks for having me. And it's really nice to see the, the session so well attended as well. Um, clearly a lot of interest in handwritten text recognition um, out there, um, which you see visible in conferences like these, which is great. So just to start with an anecdote, um, this uh, conference presentation came out of um, my colleague and supervisor, Melissa Terrace, actually having quite a rough night's sleep and sending me an email um, of you know, middle of the night thoughts on HTR, the abundance of digitized records uh, online, and new errors, I think was how we framed it initially. Um, luckily, in a case of good supervision, Melissa didn't expect an immediate response. So now, roughly two years later, here is the response, <laughs> which we together put, uh, put together, uh, which follows some similar, similar lines to the original email, some dissimilar as well. So as most of you are aware, HTR's uh, efficacy for automatically converting handwritten scripts into machine-readable format is proven um, and a clear way of presenting transcriptions in a variety of formats. This raises the question of what impact this will have on the study of history in the near future, defined as the next 10 years. In response, we provide a speculative design for HTR Using evidence collected from a grounded theory study, we present the six primary issues raised by wider HTR use. So HTR is beginning to shift historical methods and practice from sampling data to, as Gunter Milberger, father of transcribus, has described, um, an exa exhaustive interrogation of primary sources. Therefore, a horizon scan of the impact of this technology is essential preempting and addressing social, ethical, and technical issues that might arise. And this, of course, also touches on how HTR's application will generate new knowledge of and from the past. So, oh. there we go. Um, just to provide a content, uh, contents, um, we're gonna talk about the explanation, well, provide an explanation of HTR development very briefly. Um, give an overview of our methods, so the grounded theory method and then our speculative design, provide the six near future implications of HTR use, and lastly, some very brief um, conclusions and recommendations. So HTR development. Teasing out the information contained in handwritten text prior to advances in machine learning was costly and often inaccurate. Nowadays, HTR systems, as we'll see in the other presentations, routinely produce character error rates as low as 5% from handwritten text and much lower on print. Effective software includes Transcribus, operated um, under a cooperative scheme of about 85 institutions, 50 individuals, as of May 2023, spanning 30 countries. Monk, which involves um, tailored indexing for collections, um, and Cortex, the HTR for publisher Adam Matthew, Digital, other, other examples, um, as well as eScriptorum, where obviously there's representatives um, from today. So HTR stems from the gains made by OCR, recognizing regimented printed text and competitions such as those held by the International Conference on Document Analysis and Recognition. The aspiration of recognizing um, handwriting from people of various backgrounds, nationalities, professions, education, with equal competent surety and speed has now largely been realized, challenging notions that tools should only be used to recognize common keywords in historical texts. So the method that we used to answer how HTR might influence historical research more broadly, initially we used a grounded theory method, grouping and categorizing emerging themes in relevant texts. And this started with previous work um, published in archival science, um, understanding the application of HTR in heritage contexts, where we systematically cataloged the 381 um, published materials and documents which mentioned Transcribus um, at the time and still now being the biggest consumer level HTR system. So these materials formed our, informed our analysis of where HTR currently performs well and is thor th sorry, thoroughly researched. Uh, the coding of themes was reiterative as you can see, uh, returning uh, to the literature 
um, until saturation, saturation was reached. At the end of the process, about 120 texts were found, read, coded, and ordered. Concept mapping in a workshop setting and writing sprints, considering wider literature, uh, was then completed. After this foundational work, um, a very preliminary evidence-based speculative design was conducted. Speculative design, uh, defined by ALGA, is a method for rethinking assumptions about a technology's use, aesthetic, and function. Its work ranges from ideas derived um, from community in terms of redesigning cities, waste disposal systems, and how they might relate to creating a more uh, climate-conscious environment in the home, uh, through Phillips, um, challenging cultural norms around dress, um, and as you can see from, from Matsumoto as well, um, rethinking ideas about human and machine um, touch and communication um, as well. So in this way, speculative design acts as a, a perceptual bridge allowing for its experimentation and collaboration without the need for a finished commercial product at the end, unlike aligned methods like critical design. Um, yet it's not just theoretical, um, like design fictions. So using speculative design, um, we hoped our findings would allow DH researchers to better frame how HGR could eventually, and now, challenge scholars' engagement with the past. So moving on to our, our list of the six key considerations um, in the near future um, from wider HTR use. So HTR itself, a product of machine learning, has a potential to be integrated further into other AI systems. In May 2023, um, at the last Transcribus user conference um, and through uh, personal correspondence as well. Um, it was made known that Transcribus is looking at um, further integration with ChatGPT around um, the correction of uh, transcriptions after experiments by the Vienna City Library submitting transcriptions to the large language model for correction. With this, as Peterson notes, um, brings benefits in synthesizing historical data alongside a clear need uh, to center information literacy and be critical and mindful of um, bias, as we'll get onto later in the presentation, establishing the legitimacy um, of primary sources. So HTR and legal frameworks. Currently, as Corn states, uh, the public sector institutions spend considerable time in investigating copyright and undertaking risk assessments, which to some of you will be obvious and will um, obviously make up quite a a large uh, burden of your work on a daily basis. This leads some institutions to restrict usage or provide blanket disclaimers, often leading the researcher to search for the necessary permissions themselves. HTR is likely to add further complexity in figuring out the ownership of digital content. Whose role is it to ensure that materials uploaded for text recognition are out of copyright? Who owns the copyright for the resulting transcriptions? Could these be defined as novel intellectual products in their own right, needing copyright protection themselves? In addition to copyright concerns, HGR may lead to GDPR um, issues um, or exacerbate current GDPR issues. Privacy has always been a concern for historians, understanding that there is a real responsibility, um, as Lawrence details, to the dead as well as the living in records. However, HTR at scale, which removes human moderators from the loop, can exacerbate situations where information about the dead can cause social harm to the living. In some cases, anonymization, data minimization, and timely deletion may be necessary to comply with the regulations. Sensitivity review is already a common task for many um, archivists, if not all, but a significant increase in the accessibility and volume of handwritten materials available may require us to consider whether manual review is impractical and automated processes need introducing. So a shorter one um, about crediting HTR contributions. Still an open question of how to credit individuals within HTR projects 
especially in regard to model training, editing, and correcting transcriptions. This relies on a nuanced perspective of data provenance and finding a workable balance between open source licensing, rights reserved, and crediting contributions. And if you want to know more about this, you can talk to Anamika Ramine at the back um, as well in the Transcribus uh, T-shirt. So, just to bring the conversation down, um, and you know, considering we've had such a warm conference and a, a kind of, if not omnipresent, reminder of the climate crisis and where we stand at the moment between facing the likely consequences of a warming climate, though it not being inevitable just yet. Um, AI processes require a lot of energy, resulting in added carbon output and eventual uh, contribution to environmental breakdown. Bringing this to the attention of natural language processing researchers, Struble has approximated the environmental costs of six um, neural network models for a maximum of 24 hours. So OpenAI's ChatGPT, um, BERT, which is a great name um, for a model, um, being another one. Um, Struble's findings showed that advanced transformer models emit the same carbon um, emissions over 24 hours as a transatlantic flight. Reed, the cooperative behind Transcribus in 2022, um, as part of their conference, unveiled that they were beginning to train HR models using similar transformer methods, mainly because of the size of training data, the efficiencies, um, there was clearly logic behind it. But this has met with a grow growing awareness from DH of the environmental footprint of their data-led activities. And historians appreciate the need to engage in climate crisis debates um, alongside this. This follows climate conscious initiatives prioritizing efficient hardware and algorithms such as sustain NLP um, and AI for good using computational techniques to solve um, complex problems. However, methods are needed to calculate the carbon footprint of ML activities, and whether this should be the individual historian or user of the tool's purview and responsibility, um, or their um, backing university departments and institutions, is beyond the scope of this presentation, but relates to existing debates around personal corporate responsibility. The notion of differentiated responsibility is also key here with AI language models excluding the same marginalized communities who are being adversely impacted by the climate crisis. So data ethics and bias. Explicit and implicit institutional biases can shape and control our access to the past. Much of recorded history is not pleasant and we need new paradigms to mitigate difficult histories and the biases inherent in handwritten texts given that we cannot eradicate them. Using handwritten sources at scale requires a data ethics-led approach to HTR, given research should consider ethical contexts. Historians need a knowledge of automated processes which underpin their activities. And unless historians understand how digital archives are created, embedded biases cannot be surfaced or interrogated. This requires platform providers to establish uh, approaches, training, and understanding. Finally, on to um, integrating the results of HR into collection systems and processes. HR provides clear opportunities for the better description and cataloging of digital collections. Integrating transcriptions with technologies such as IIIF, so the International Image Interoperability Framework, and the Text Encoding Initiative the automatic generation of transcriptions for a broad, from a broad range of collections will allow keyword spotting across collections, facilitating search against tagged name identities, such as place names, dates, and individuals. All of this has a profound impact on the study of history, performing more surgical analysis of the past when needed. Of course, HCR's wider adoption will not automatically clean up an institution's catalog, wish that was the case, um, but we should be mindful alongside this as Seely Brown and Duguid warned over two decades ago of wishing on technology to solve radical changes in scholarly research without enacting new codes of practice. There is, however, future potential for HCR to be used in automated metadata extraction. 
and I'm making good time. So just some preliminary recommendations um, and more on this hopefully soon. Um, in conclusion, in laying out some, not all, um, of the near future amplifications of HTR, it becomes obvious that there is an inherent complexity in using historical handwritten documents in data-rich environments. As such, tool design and platform development provides impetus for collaboration, conveniently the theme for this conference. Working across, as Kemen describes, trading zones, establishing shared vocabularies and workflows, ensuring that HCR tools meet the needs of historical researchers. This re requires a moral responsibility to embed values of transparency, searchability, accessibility, and support into HTR technologies, given the changes they are making to the wider information environment. To navigate these complex issues needs skills development in using HTR and aligned technologies and the development of best practice principles and protocols to ensure the future makes the most of our handwritten past. So thank you very much. <laughs>